Can we thank God for what he's doing in this space and place? Hey, if it is your first time to the Father's House, Orange County, we want to say welcome. I believe that every once in a while we need a little, we need a little praise break in our life. I'm grateful that you're here today. Um, if you are new or visiting, if you are watching online from any corner of the globe or you're in the video experience, we just wanna say you have a space here at the Father's House. In addition to that, if you've been with us, you know that we have been in a series entitled Ish. Somebody say Ish. Your mama's not here, you can say it. Somebody say Ish. Ish, issues that the church don't like to talk about. Uh, today, we're going to be tackling a topic that I'm really excited because I believe it is a perva pervasive issue in the world that is weighing down so many believers and unbelievers. And so we're not going to run from it. We're not going to try to give some thin and make answers to it. We're going to tackle it head on, wrap some theology around it. And I'm honored that today in the house, uh, a friend of this house, as I shared earlier, uh, stepping in and living in a miracle of this building and this community was in part to those that call TFHOC home and gave to this church, but also some friends and family that came around us. And uh, Pastor Toby and his wife Micah um, hail from the great country of Texas. Somebody say a yeehaw up in here. Yes. I have some Texas friends. You guys leave Texas, and now you have Texas here in California. Uh, but today, we get to welcome a wonderful friend. I even put hot rollers in my hair to give it some bounce and some love because everything's bigger in Texas. But will you give a warm TFHOC welcome to Pastor Toby Slaw? Wow, so very kind. You guys can be seated. I know you guys at home are already sitting down, but we're going to sit down in here. Hey, it is great to be with you today. Uh, I have looked forward to this day for a long time. A couple of things you need to know about me, because it'll, I think, help you from to hear everything God wants you to hear today. The first thing is this. I'm going to cry some. And uh, let me tell you why. It's because I'm, not, I'm a sentimental old man. I went to the doctor, said I need a blood test. If there's something, I mean, like I got an estrogen, testosterone problem, I need a pill, or my, he said, no, you're just a sentimental old man, so don't, don't look at me and go, why is that boy crying? Because that's what I do. Uh, the second thing is I believe God brought us together today. Now, I want you to hear me. I think a lot of times we just put it on autopilot. I mean, well, it's Sunday. We're going to church. I got my car. No, God brought us to this place on this day. Because he has a personal word he wants to speak into every one of our lives. So if you don't believe it, you're here because your girlfriend made you come and says she's breaking up if, she don't, if you don't go to church with her. Whatever it is, I'm, I'm down with you being here. But I have enough faith for you to believe that God wants to say something in your life Amen. today. Third thing about me I think that you is important for you to know is uh, how much I hate the beach. Anybody else got a brother, sister out there into, into the beach? Now, you understand, I grew up on the Texas Gulf Coast, okay, not the California coast. I grew up where yesterday the devil was high-fiving a locust. I mean, that's how hot. It's like 106 in the shade down there. But I grew up 15 minutes from the beach. I went to the beach like many of you go to the beach. And if my wife never made me go back, that would be fine with me. I hate the sand. Sand in my shorts and my sandwich is not a good look for me. I hate the sun. Come on, look somebody at this head. In that, you, I just, there's, most of all, I dislike the beach because if we could sit down and talk for a while, I'm going somewhere, stay with me. Man, like I have like an unhealthy, irrational fear of drowning. I'm not talking about like a healthy respect. I'm talking about a counselor needs to get it out. A believer needs to cast it out. Kind of like un, un, irrational fear of drowning. I, I can't stand water that I can't see to the bottom. You say, well, why? Well, I was eight years old. As I said, I grew up 15 minutes from the beach. I walked in to the living room one night as my mom and dad were talking about a dear family friend that had drowned surf fishing at the beach. In fact, I called my dad before I began to tell this story again this past year and said, Dad, how many family friends did we lose? He said six. Through the years, I said, Dad, how does someone drown as an eight-year-old? Dad, how does that happen? I asked him, and he said, well, they step in a hole, and the undertow gets them. And he looked at me and said, Son, that's why you have to be careful when we go to the beach. 
So I was a little eight-year-old boy. I get in my bed that night, and I start thinking, what, what, what would it be like if I drowned at the beach? Would anybody come to my funeral? How many of you know that if you start thinking about something long enough, if you fix your mind on it long enough, it goes from what if I drown to I'm going to drown? Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So I went to bed that night, tears running down my little eight-year-old face, begging God, God, please don't let me drown. Please don't let me drown. I had no idea as an eight-year-old that for the next 50 years of my life, that would be the prayer that I would pray the most. God, don't let me drown. Now, come on, somebody, you identify with that at some level in our world today, don't you? We're drowning. We're drowning in uncertainty. We're drowning in hate and anger and division and a cancel culture. And we're drowning emotionally. Do you know that pre-COVID, 30% of children 18 and younger were, had been diagnosed with some level of anxiety, depression, or general, generally feeling overwhelmed by life. You know what the percentage is now? 68%. The stats are astounding. That our kids and their parents feel like they're drowning. Here's the sad part, though. Some of us really believe that drowning is our destiny. <laughs> that the life Jesus promised is a life where you could just keep your neck above water. It's not the abundant life that Jesus promised. Now, I'm a Jesus guy. Full disclosure here. I'm, I'm, I'm all in on Jesus. And I know that Jesus told me that if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. But you know what we don't think about enough? You believe a lie, it has the same inherent power to bind you up that a lie does to set you free. Some of you need to hear that again. You believe a lie long enough and it has the same power to bind you up. That the truth does to set you free. And so Jesus' encouragement is to know the truth. So I want to take just a few moments today as a fellow struggler with many of you who has battled now a 27 and a half year diagnosis of an acute anxiety and panic disorder. And tell you a little bit about the three big lies that I have to regularly fight if I want to experience the life that Jesus promised. You with me? Now, look at me, everybody. You guys at home, watch, look at me. I ain't giving you three steps to never be anxious again. I, there are not four. Here's four principles in which you'll never be depressed again. I'm going to say this a hundred times a day. Look at me. Freedom is not the absence of anxiety. It's the presence of God's power in the middle of it. Okay? Freedom isn't the absence of something. It is the presence of somebody in the middle of it. So you ready for these three lies that I have believed? Maybe you've believed them too. Number one, if, you want it, if you're taking notes, write this down. Problems signal the absence of God in my life. If I have a problem, if there's a challenge, look at me, everybody. Either there's something wrong with God or there's something wrong with me. Because good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And then you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who did not say, hey, we're going to be in the Bible one day. Let's just step on in this fire. <laughs> Daniel in the lion's den over and over again Scripture says to me 
that problems usually signal the beginning of God's involvement in a powerful way, not his absence in your life. I'm about done with it. Well, if God is good, then why does da-da-da-da-da happen to me? Because you live in a fallen world where ish happens to you. You're not better than anyone else. You just have a secret weapon called the Holy Spirit that lives in you. You have a power available to you that those who have not yet come to know Jesus do not possess. But signals do not, I mean, problems do not signal the absence of God. But if you're right now, if you got a problem, buckle your seatbelt because God's about to move in your life if you'll let Him. Now, B, I got a life verse. You know how your life verse, you don't get to pick it. It picks you. Right? And the life verse that picked me, that God gave me, like nobody wants it. My life verse is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul, the greatest missionary this side of the cross, the reason that you can proclaim faith in Jesus, Paul said, man, God had gifted me and blessed me in so many ways that he allowed a messenger of Satan, a thorn in my flesh. And I, the word connects so much to me. He said, it's like it tormented me. Now, there's been all this debate about what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. I'm going to give you the Bible answer. We have no idea. You know why? Because God wants to see He wants you to see your struggle in Paul's life. The thorn is inconsequential. The power of God is what you're looking for here. So Paul says, I've got this thorn in the flesh. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And we just kind of want to run through that because it makes us uncomfortable. I don't know if it's a literal three. I don't know if it's three days in a row, three nights in a row. I don't know if it's three years. But over and over again, the greatest missionary this side of the cross said, there's one thing God I want you to do for me. And God said, look, no. My grace is efficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. You tell me who's got that on a coffee cup. No, my grace is efficient. Nobody puts that on a, co- nobody puts that on a shirt and wears it to church camp. And nobody going to the Christian store and getting a poster that says three times I asked God to take this away. And he said, no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this, though. You, I believe that this biographical statement by Paul is that is if you understand what he understood in that moment, everything else he says begins to make sense. That Paul's ministry was around not a yes, it was around a no. That God truly was able to begin to work in his life when he came to the end of himself. And that Paul found that his weakness was not something to hide, but it was something to boast about so that people could see God's power at work in his life. I'll tell you something, my wife's here today, man. All right. 27 and a half years. She's. Uh, We've been married 36, 27 and a half, man. She has heard me stand on stages and cry and talk about 17 days of no sleeping and driving my car down I-35, swerving at the last minute not to kill myself. I know what it's like to feel like the world would be better without you. (laughs) To convince yourself that you are beyond hope. But it's in the weakness where God's power shows up. It's what God leverages for his glory and the thing that you are the most embarrassed about. Come on, you men that battle anxiety, depression, we feel like girls, don't we? Which is nothing wrong with being a girl unless you're a guy. But... I am convinced that it's where God does his best work. Number two. Anybody still with me? Number two. I have believed the lie for way too long that faith fixes everything. There's two extremes in our world today. 
as it comes to the concept of mental illness. Now, I'm a veteran, man. I'm a varsity letterman, so I know about this, right? One extreme is don't be a baby. That was my generation. My dad just rubbed some dirt on it. You'll be all right, right? The church, it was if you just read your Bible more, if you just pray more, which repels the very people we want to draw to Jesus because they're reading their Bible, they're praying. Or the people who say, hey, you can't take medicine if you've got mental struggles because that's showing a lack of faith. You know what I say to someone who comes to me and says, man, I've got diabetes. Listen, let's pray for your healing. Now take your insulin. Right? Some, the, the, one of the extremes is you poor baby. But you know what the other extreme is? The other extreme from don't be a baby is, oh, you poor baby. We're, we're making our kids and we're deciding we're going to be victims. <laughs> like my identity is not, I'm Toby the panic guy. I am a child of the king who is daily overcoming a battle with anxiety in my life. Right? My faith equips me to walk through the valley of the shadow. It does not, like, exempt me from the valley of the shadow. True confession? Like, I really want to be an overcomer, don't you? But I don't like to have things to overcome. I want to be more than a conqueror as long as I don't have to conquer something. I love the song Oceans as long as I'm not in the ocean up to my neck. Like, give yourself a break. You know why you're dep fighting depression or anxiety? Because you're a human being living in a crazy world. There is nothing wrong with you. And you have not been disqualified from empowerment and being used in the kingdom of God. Amen. You are not being a baby and you are not a victim to what you're struggling with. You've got to redefine the target of your life. The target of your life is not the absence of those things. The target of your life is you show the devil. I have to show the devil all the time. Hey, man. <sighs> You're not taking me down. What, three, four weeks ago, worst panic attack I've had in a couple of years. Out of the blue. But here's the thing. I don't panic about a panic attack. I don't feel shame when I have a panic attack. I tell the devil, you ain't beating me. And I don't do it as well as I can do what God's called me to do when I'm coming out of a, a season of anxiety, but I still do it. Why? Because I walk by faith and not by sight. Don't misunderstand me. I'm no superhero. There's my wife, amens. Uh, <laughs> I just have an undying belief that Jesus is with me yeah. in the middle of my struggle. I don't, uh, I ask him every day to take it off of me. I just don't need him to do it for me to believe that he's real. Wow. That is so good. How in the world could I put a condition, condition on a relationship with a God who loves me unconditionally? That's called dysfunctional relationship. My faith doesn't fix everything. My faith equips me to face anything. Okay. And so through the years, I have discovered some biblical tools that help me access my faith in the moments where I am the weakest. I can't go through all of them, but I will tell you one, though. Uh, if you were sitting around me over here or you saw me standing over here and you thought, why is this guy over here? Why does he look like a fifth grade girl who lost her lunch at recess? Uh, it's because I get so moved when we worship, not because these guys are awesome, although they're awesome. You know why? Because we are declaring things to be true. Yeah. Yeah. Our faith is verbal, yeah. right? Your faith is verbal. Jesus didn't say, 
And the wind stopped. What did he say? Peace, be still. Why? Because in the kingdom, you speak things into reality. And when you don't feel something to be true, singing it or saying it is not hypocrisy. It is an act of faith. Right? And I get so moved in worship because as my friends who are with me today can tell you, the greatest tool I have is a little tool called the 40 I Am's. 40 statements that God did say are true about me. And I had a dear older pastor friend over almost 18 years ago that I called when I was struggling. He said, go Google the 40 I Am's. Write them on note cards. And if I would have brought them with me today, which I usually do, I pulled them out and I showed you they're covered in snot and tears and dirt because I have thrown those things down and screamed those things out when I feel them the least. That's how you do battle with the enemy. You speak, you sing, you declare what is you know to be true, which doesn't feel true at the moment. Hey, everybody look at me. Please feel your feelings. But understand that your feelings are a terrible steering wheel for your life. Feel the feelings and then refuse to allow the feelings to define your direction. Let God define your direction. And then finally, number three, this is a big one, and you're going to have to stay with me. I'm going to unpack it in 12 minutes and 10 seconds, maybe. That my strategy for my life is the same as God's purpose for my life. I think that's the biggest lie that I've had to overcome. Now, Jesus is clear. If you're going to build a tower, make a plan. God's not against planning, but... If you are breathing, you were created on purpose and for a purpose. And the greatest adventure of your life is discovering what your purpose is. And it rarely comes in an aha moment. And you don't get to pick it. God picks it for you, right? But once you discover what your purpose is, what we do as humans is we begin to build a strategy for how that purpose is going to be fulfilled. Oh, I'm going to plant a church, and then I'm going to do this, and then this is going to happen... You know your strategy is always up and to the right. You know that, right? Your strategy never goes back and forth and down and up. And what happens when your strategy isn't working, you start doubting the calling when you forget it was God's calling and your strategy. Uh And you abandon and, and you submit to something less than what God has called you to. Because you go, well, obviously this one is God's will. It's not, he shut the door. No, you shut the door. In fact, that's the door you weren't even supposed to go in the first place. And most of the time it's because your calling being fulfilled isn't in your highlights, it's in your lowlights. Right? The, that's where the power of your calling comes. So Mike and I, I'll tell you quickly, we're in college at Abilene Christian University in West Texas. A sweet little college in one of the ugliest places on the planet. And... Uh, I'm, I've, I've got, I'm, I'm going to go to work as a pharmaceutical rep, and we're going to go to the East Coast, and we're going to make a bunch of money. And one night at the end of a service, a Wednesday night service, during the announcements, because sometimes God speaks in the announcements, so you all listen. And uh, <laughs> the youth pastor got up and said, I'm, we're needing some volunteers to work in our student ministry. And so I volunteered and went in. And how many of you know, man, like if you're a warm body, they're going to just give you more and more and more. <laughs> And I moved from teaching the class to leading the group to interacting with kids on a one-on-one basis. And I remember coming home and saying to Mike, hey, man, like these kids, when I talk, they're listening to me. Because I usually did all the stuff they had done. And uh, I I felt called into ministry. And so I gave my life to ministry. I had this dream of what ministry was going to be for me. And I worked with students for about eight years and Found a guy who would invest in me. You know, if you, add, if, you, if you honor those that you want to invest in you, honor always gives you access. You give honor not for access, just like you don't give to get. But when you honor, you get access. Amen. So, man, I'm driving him to funerals and learning how to do funerals. I'm driving him to weddings, and he's teaching me how to make a wedding more personal. Back then, there was no internet. That's why we were so happy. And... Uh, <laughs> I was cutting stories out of Reader's Digest for his message, giving him illustrations. That'll date me a little bit. But uh, 
he taught me everything he knew. And he helped me find my first job as a lead pastor. And I led a church. And the church exploded in the middle of the Metroplex. And I had a sweet wife and two beautiful kids in our church. Had quintupled in size at that point in time. And we're building buildings. And that's the day I was driving on I-35. Like, I wasn't, not at, and it scared me that I came this close to ending my life. And I went to see a counselor. In fact, I saw several over the next few months. I bought counselors all around Dallas, had boats called the SS Toby because of how much money I paid these guys. <laughs> And I started to feel a little bit better. And on bad days, I would say to my wife, baby, we just, we need to quit, man. man. These people deserve a stronger pastor than me. And they did. On my good days, I would say, God's going to heal me. And I'm going to write a book one day. I'm going to go all over the world and use all the gifts God's given me to be a picture for people of what freedom can really be when you battle this and you don't battle it anymore. And I, I am embarrassed to say this because I was a part of creating an environment, but like in our church, that, that was the last place I wanted to go when I was hurting because I was embarrassed. I wanted to create a church that would be the first place people would want to go, not the last. And uh, that was 27 and a half years ago. If you're looking for a guy who can say, and here's how I got eliminated all of that panic disorder and anxiety from my life, I'm the wrong guy. I still battle it. I don't get it, man. I've spoken all over the world. I've spoken to 30,000 in Mumbai, India, where I've asked people to stand who wanted to get lifted off of them. I get unsolicited emails about how God took something off of them. I'm still battling. I've had more oil poured on my head than a Jiffy Lube through the years, man. <laughs> I got 21 prayer languages. I mean, I, I'm, I mean, I'm in on whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. But that wasn't God's plan for me. I would have never written it this way. I don't like being a big baby crying old bald man. And they finally talked me into it after almost 20 years of planting and leading a church. I wrote out my life story. I didn't want to because it's like counseling. You got to open the box and relive all that stuff. It just makes you want to throw up again. And, but I did. I did. I wrote a book and it was called Not Yet. Uh, Finding Freedom When Anxiety, Depression, and Other Crap Comes Knocking at Your Door was literally the title of the book. <laughs> and five weeks later, the pandemic hit. And I learned what the other crap was. Uh, but when I wrote the book in the last chapter, I was trying to find a way to end it. And I kept coming back to the story of a salmon fish, you know, in the Pacific Northwest. But it seemed cliche. So I literally Googled one day, what's another fish like a salmon fish? And I learned about a little fish called the goby fish, G-O-B-Y. It's found only in Hawaii. It's a salmon with a better ending. You know, it doesn't spawn and die. It starts in the salt water and halfway during its life, when the tide is just right, which is important, it begins to climb up these mountain streams in one island in Hawaii, and it spends the second half of its life living in the top of these freshwater of these streams at the top of these mountains. The interesting part about the goby fish is halfway up, his bottom jaw begins to grow. It's all pictures of it. Why? So they can suck on the rocks and get to the top when it gets steep. Now, you understand that when the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God, it's not saying, look at the stars and remember how big God is. It's saying, if you want to know how the kingdom works, look at creation. And what the Gobi fish taught me was the very thing that I was avoiding is the very thing God is using to transform my life. And that's what Paul meant when he said, I'll boast even in my weakness. And so I launched the book. I shared the series. I didn't know how to finish the series. So good old Google, my research assistant, how do you draw a fish? I literally did and spent the next six hours 
with a YouTube video on how to draw a fish. I called my creative director, B, did you know, Jen Day, and I said, hey, I've got an idea. We're going to finish this series. I'm going to draw. I'm going to tell a little story about a fish, a goby fish. Well, how are you going to draw it? I said, well, give me some paper. And she said, well, you can't draw. I said, yeah, I can. I've been on YouTube for six hours. I'm an expert. And <laughs> so that night I had all these easels up on our board, and I told the story of a little fish, a goby, and I named him Toby the goby because <laughs> it rhymed with me. And I told the story about a little fish who could do hard things because God was with it. But it's important he doesn't begin to travel until the tide is right. The tide is all about the position of the sun, so you have to keep your eyes on the sun. Amen. But the crazy thing is he could even help others along the way. So I told the story. The people loved it, and I said, that was a fun thing. Now let's go, let's go shared not yet around the country, and the pandemic hit three weeks later. And so I called my daughter-in-law, who is a graphic designer, graphic artist. In fact, she was approached by Disney to, for a contract. She's pretty good at what she does. And I said, hey, you want to live your dream? And she said, what's that? And I said, you want to write a kid's book? And she said, sure. And Toby the Gobi was born. <laughs> now, I need, I need you to hear... Yeah, it's pretty cool. Willie the Whale and Allie the Albatross are the two little friends because when I was a kid, I loved the song Little River Band, Cool Change, and the whale. and the, That's a whole other story. But we told the story, and here's what happened. The book exploded. And I was like, no, man, my plan was I'm going to go talk to adults about how to overcome. But this, it spread everywhere. It's crazy. Well, I've been literally all over this country. I had no idea that around the world, the Chicago fire of our culture, my friends, is mental health for kids. Stats prove it. And I had no idea that although moms and dads would not be open to learning and growing, many of them, to become more mentally well, they're all in on tools for their kids because their kids are struggling. And so for the last six months, we've traveled around this country telling kids that they can do hard things because God is with them. But they've got to keep their eyes on the sun. But most importantly, they can even help others along the way. And we rewrote the 40 I Am's for kids. My little six-year-old grandson, who is a little scared of his shadow, got a little of his papa in him, got a little anxiety in him, he picks five of those statements that are hard for him to believe, and he colors the little drawing. He tapes them up on his wall. I just think we can do better than fidget spinners and weighted blankets. The sky's not falling, my friends. We have an opportunity like we've never had before to connect the power of God to very real problems in people's lives. And Harvard says that the number one indicator of the mental wellness of a child, guess what it is? Anybody got an idea? It's the mental wellness of their parent. So if God opens the door for us to share this kingdom, Jesus-bathed gospel message with kids, this is the way I think we can reach the world. And in some of the places that I've been... Uh, been so cool to watch moms and dads grab these books and pass them out to families in their neighborhoods as a way to share the gospel with them in a non-threatening way and we'll launch next month in South America with the Spanish version with Toby the Gobi and God willing we will launch in January of next year in Hindi in India because they're asking they're begging for tools to help their kids and by the end of the next year, we will be in the Middle East Amen. in seven different dialects of Farsi connected to an organization. Listen, because God, like he's bigger than you. He'll take your crap and he'll turn it into something beautiful. Amen. He will take the very thing that you have begged him to take away and he will leverage it for your good and his glory.
I have staked my life on that God is at work in all things. Not just the church things, the ish things he's in. So don't you dare try to be something you're not. Find freedom in being exactly who you are and putting your faith and your hope, not in a concept or an idea, but a person named Jesus Christ. He's not a great thing to have in your life. He is your life. I had a lady the other day. She was a acupuncturist. And she was she was uh, Chinese, but not like Chinese American. Like three years ago, she moved here. And she's putting these things in me and she's talking to me. What do you do for a living? Well, I, I write books for kids and I'm a mental health advocate and follower of Jesus and she says, I don't, I'm, I know believe in God. Okay. You got the pens, baby. I'm not going to argue with you right now. <laughs> she said, Miss so-and-so here last week told me if I didn't believe in God, I'd go to hell. What do you think? And I said, I think that if I did not believe in God, that the thought of a God I did not believe in sending me to a hell that I didn't think existed would make me want to believe in God. Oh, I'm just a sea planter, man. I'm, God closes the deal, not me, right? We wait a minute, and I said, you want to know why I believe in God? And she said, yeah. I said, it's not because I'm scared of going to hell one day. It's I don't want to live in hell tomorrow. I don't know how you live your life without a power greater than yourself encouraging you along the way. And I think rather than me espousing to her the reality of a Christless eternity someplace in the far, far away, she could grasp the idea that Jesus could change her tomorrow because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So here's what I want to do today as we close. I just want to pray for you. Again, I've traveled all over this country, all over the world in the last 10 years of my life, and I've just prayed for people who struggle in their mental health. Uh, and I've watched God do powerful things in people's lives. I've watched God lift it off of people. And I've also watched God empower people with strength they didn't know they have to walk it out. And uh, sometimes the greatest courage of the human heart is just like raising your hand when everything within you doesn't want to admit this is your battle. So I think it's your act of faith today. I mean, come on, man. I've sat here and just kind of bared my guts. Surely you could raise your hand in a moment and admit that you need some help in this area of your life. So we just bow our heads wherever we are. That's not, I don't want to be weird, but close your eyes just so people could feel like it's a private moment, right? So Father, here we are. I think sometimes when we hurt and we feel like our prayers don't reach the ceiling, we forget that in your kingdom, you promise that you are very near. It's because you ain't past the ceiling. You're right here with us. And I know there are some today, Father, who are where I have been so many times. Lord, I want to believe, but you need to help my unbelief. And I, just so I'm believing in faith, surely among us there's a mustard seed. There's a work of the Spirit that is indescribable that you want to do in the lives of your people because you love them. And so, Father, I'm just going to raise my hand today and say, I need your help in this area. I need, I need more healing, more strength more of your power. I can't do it on my own. Anybody else with me? So if you are, even if you're sitting at home, just raise your hands and just say, man, this is a battle for me. I, I battle some depression. I battle some anxiety. I battle feeling overwhelmed by life. Lord, we love you and we need you. I pray by faith for a supernatural deliverance for many in this moment that they may tomorrow wake up and say, you know what? 
Like I feel this was lifted off of me. And Father, I pray that you would do that. But even if you do not, Father, I pray for a measure of your strength and power and peace to come in the lives of those who battle. Come on, who needs a little power and peace today? I pray for our kids, Lord. I pray, Father, that the contagious nature of our overcoming faith would infiltrate our homes, our schools, our communities. May your kingdom come, Jesus, in our house, in our lives, as it's being done in heaven. And so, Father, we declare hope and faith today, even though some of us don't feel like it's true, we declare what is true. We lift our voices, we lift our hands, we stand to our feet in this moment, and we join heaven in declaring truth over the lives of our, our own lives, our family's lives, and the lives of those we love. For thine is the kingdom, Lord, the power and the glory in Jesus' name. Jesus' name, amen. Come on, folks, let's stand up together wherever you are. Let's stand, declare this together.